Great, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to share four observations about social determinants of health and big data. And I wanna do this by telling you the story of my father. My father uh, lived with prostate cancer for many years and he eventually died of prostate cancer in this past year. He's like many African-American men. African-American men are almost two times as likely to develop prostate cancer, and if they develop it, they're twice as likely to die compared with white men. Prostate cancer is an interesting disease because for many men, it is a slow-growing disease where they will have it and die of something else. And for some, it is an aggressive disease. It's a disease that occurs earlier in life, and, uh, and for... African-American men, they're more likely to be in this group where it is aggressive and that it occurs earlier. Now, we know how to treat prostate cancer. The treatments are effective, but they have side effects like impotence, incontinence, and in rare cases, death. We'd like to know how to target those types of treatments to the individuals who have the most aggressive forms of cancer, especially if it's something that's gonna happen earlier in an individual's life. And so this is an ideal condition for precision approaches. The challenge is, is for prostate cancer is that less than half of the studies that, um, of uh, treatments for prostate cancer actually include any African-Americans. And among our screening studies, African-American men are included in numbers that are not compatible with their representation in the population. We've had an explosion of uh, genetic data, and uh, this graph really shows um, uh, that uh, trend over time. And that explosion has occurred, unfortunately, almost exclusively among uh, European-descended uh, populations. And that means our excitement about the use of this data in practice, most currently our excitement is around polygenic risk scores, it uh, creates these certain types of biases so that um, genetic risk scores that are developed in one population actually perform remarkably poorly in other populations. So the first point that I want to make here is not about social determinants of health. It is about diversifying our representation in our genetic studies, which is probably the way many of us got to big data and precision health. And I want to make this point because panels on social determinants of health oftentimes veer into inequitable distributions of social factors that relate to health. This is a factor decidedly in our control as scientists, as clinicians who implement these scores. Understanding when these scores don't work in patient populations is actually our own responsibility. And it's our own responsibility to figure out how we do this better. So I want to turn back to my father. My father grew up on a farm in Virginia. Um, he, for him, military service was the pathway to uh, upward mobility. Military service is the place you can see the world, and you also have the opportunity to be exposed to many things. In this case, this is Agent Orange in Vietnam. He grew up in the South in, uh, during a time of segregation, where he went to segregated schools. When he married my mother, who's German, this was illegal in the state where he was living. And throughout his life, while many of these things changed, factors like racism, of course, uh, whether interpersonal or structural racism, uh, persisted throughout his life. Being from the South, he also enjoyed a good plate of Southern food. Now, all of these factors in individual studies have been shown to contribute to risk for prostate cancer, as well as to the acceleration of prostate cancer. We know these are important, but understanding how they intersect with our understanding of the biological determinants of prostate cancer is not well known. And this is where we have the opportunity, given the opportunity of new types of data sources, to think beyond um, our, our ever-increasing opportunities to phenotype individuals based on biological characteristics, but to also understand how the social characteristics, the social and environmental factors that we know also influence uh, the development of disease happen. This will require, of course, new uses of data, new uses of types of data, and I think that's the opportunity and challenge. 
So here, new data sources, new scientific methods uh, will allow us to really understand for complex phenotypes that we've really well characterized biologically, how those intersect with the other factors that we know to be important to the development of disease. Now, there's a lot of interest in social determinants of health. This is a, a National Academy study that I was fortunate to be part of and uh, asking which social determinants we should actually put into electronic health records. And as you can see, a lot of uh, places have actually adopted um, elements of these social determinants. The rationale for the National Academies Committee was to really say what factors could help a clinician in the care of a patient, what factor could help uh, clinicians think about population health, so how a health system thinks about a group of patients that they're trying to take care of, and what factors would help us accelerate research on the intersection of social determinants of health and uh, particular health states. So this was the short list of 10, but there are, of course, many, many others that um, have this particular characteristic. So we're at the point where we're trying to figure out what we actually do with this type of data. What is it useful for um, beyond the understanding for that individual patient? And I want to give an, an example here of the way Cincinnati Children's has used its data. Um, they are very interested in where their patients are and the context in which they live um, and have thought about this across these multiple domains here. They wanted to use this data to think about how they could reduce readmissions for children with asthma. It's not going to surprise you that readmissions for children with asthma might concentrate in uh, more poor communities, which in fact it did. But what they found when they actually were, uh, looked at the locations of their asthma readmissions, that they were occurring not just in one neighborhood, but one specific apartment complex. And so this is a case where they had been thinking about intervening and predicting readmissions based on individual factors, but eventually used the data to intervene on the apartment complex itself, and thereby taking what they found in a few patients and actually improving the environment where many, many more patients were living using the data in this way. These are early days to figure out how we use this in population health, but I think the incentives and the alignment uh, around many things suggest that there are opportunities to think about these factors, not just in how we improve health for individual patients, but how we can actually intervene in settings that we might not have intervened in before. This is our look at... Uh, data on diabetes in San Francisco. It turns out if you ha are diabetic and your diabetes is controlled, those cases don't cluster in San Francisco. But uncontrolled cases of diabetes do in fact cluster. They, don't, they cluster in the poorer communities in San Francisco, perhaps not surprisingly. They also cluster in other places that you wouldn't expect. And this gives us an opportunity to think about what's happening in those areas and other points of intervention, because we know diabetes is as much about context as it is about individual behavior. We've thought about this also in terms of how, um, how our patients uh, age and where they are aging. We're interested in them aging in place. This is data across two health systems, but mapped on a background of where uh, green space is in San Francisco or where walkability is. Both of these are factors that greatly influence um, an individual's uh, social environment and therefore their ability uh, to manage certain chronic conditions and in some cases in aging, aging successfully at home. So I think this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity, the interest in population health, the interest in integrating um, measures of social determinants into the electronic health record offers up new opportunities for how we might intervene, not just on patients, but on actually communities themselves. There's, of course, risk here, and we've talked a lot about biases in healthcare records. So new data offers new opportunity and also challenges to think about how to use this in the way that best uh, achieves the health goals of our patients. 
So I want to end with my fourth point by talking about where I was yesterday, which was at the Solve Summit. I love coming to Stanford to promote a UCSF event. That's a thing of mine. So um, this is the, the Solve Summit. So I work at San Francisco General Hospital, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, and we've been very interested in the use of digital technologies to improve the health of our patients. And sometimes people are surprised by that. But it turns out cell phones are very ubiquitous. There is a great need to support our patients in how they manage their chronic conditions. And oftentimes, being able to do this in a more cost-effective manner is actually of interest to the health system as well. And several types of digital technologies offer that possibility. Now, this is a challenge because these technologies are developed in not my patients. And so figuring out how to adapt them to our patients is one of the things that has been a major focus in our center and in this particular group, the Solve Health Tech group led by Ermi Malasarkar and uh, Courtney Lyles. We have experience doing this. We can show it works. We can show that patients are interested. And it turns out, although you're not going to market this to my patients at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, Medicaid is very interested in these types of technologies as well. And they're very interested in thinking about how they can uh, uh, use these types of technologies to improve um, uh, Medicaid population's health. So this was our event yesterday, co-sponsored by the UCSF Health Hub. And we basically uh, had 33 companies who applied to work with uh, the Solve Health Tech team. Six of them presented yesterday. They expected to choose two winners. They ended up choosing three. And those three will work with the team here to really adapt their particular digital technologies uh, to uh, address uh, the interest of more low-income, uh, diverse patient populations. The three winners were Inquisit Health. It does, uh, it's a digital platform for peer mentoring that they've shown works successfully to help uh, control diabetes, and they have a program that's very interested in uh, culturally, tailored, culturally tailored interventions and uh, culturally matching uh, peers via this platform. Uh, Mommy, which I love that name, Mommy, um, recognized what we all know if you've been watching the news, that um, they're the perinatal, postnatal period for many low-income women, particularly African-American women, is one that's very vulnerable uh, period of time. We have high rates of uh, maternal mortality compared to our uh, a country of our, our resources should have. And Mommy recognized basically that there were um, uh, many uh, that we live in a fragmented healthcare system, and this period of time was particularly vulnerable to fragmentation. So data coming for the child, coming for the mom, and a period when mom is uh, between you know, being pregnant and being not pregnant and being home. And so this is a platform that integrates these multiple data streams and actually helps uh, to actually have uh, data and then interventions in one place uh, during a particularly vulnerable period of time. And then the last one was Applied VR that uh, is addressing another timely topical issue of uh, the opioid epidemic and has been using vid uh, virtual reality to find non-opioid uh, strategies for pain management and very interested in adapting this approach to a more diverse and low-income population. So I do think that um, for those of you who are in the tech sector, this is a, a, an interesting time and the opportunities to think about the power of these technologies for more uh, resource-limited, low-income patients, I think is a, a really interesting and, um, and uh, uh, really exciting opportunity now. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.